Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so this is work, uh, joint work with uh, Nefokutsky and uh, and I wrote their names in the wrong order. That's, but okay. Um, so this is a uh, kind of an old-fashioned kind of talk. It's a uh, data structures problem that dates back you know, 25 years or so. And there were upper bounds known and, and some restricted lower bounds. And we somehow returned to this problem and found unrestricted lower bounds for it. So uh, let me tell you what the problem is. It's got two descriptions. So I'm going to mostly talk about it in the language of the file maintenance problem. So we have an array with m locations. And uh, we receive, in an online fashion, n numbers in the range, uh, let's say they're integers, in the range 1 to r. So there are three parameters, m, n, and r. And we um, and we want to store the numbers in the array uh, in sorted order. So you put the numbers, as the numbers come in, you place them in the array. Uh, you can leave gaps, all right? And so what happens is, you know, maybe as you get the numbers, you leave gaps, but the gaps fill in. And eventually things get so crowded, you have to actually start moving stuff around. And uh, you pay every time you move something. So every time you, every time you restore an element, and so you pay one each time uh, an item is stored or moved. OK. Um, and then you just want to minimize the cost. All right, so. Uh, What's that again? Not all Let's say yeah. either, either. So if it, if you're trying to do upper bounds, you want worst case, and if it's uh, lower bounds, you'd like to prove amortized. Um, okay, so there are three parameters, and if you think about it a second, the problem is uninteresting unless the parameters are in a certain relationship. So it's an M and R. Um, if M is bigger than or equal to R. Then there's a trivial solution. Just well, that means that the the item number the items are in the range one through r, so you can just store item i in location i. And if The items coming in are distinct. Yeah. Okay. And if n is greater than m, you can't do it. Because you run out of space. So uh, less than r. Okay. So uh, what can you do? Um, so. So there's a paper of I don't know when this is maybe 1984 that introduced the problem 
and gave an amortized equals uh, okay so this is kind of the most the hardest from the upper bound point of view these are the hardest parameters that you can hope to do so R is arbitrary so I, I put no restriction on the range at all and the amount of space you have is only linear in the uh, in the number of things you want to store, so you don't have a lot of extra. Okay, so to be more precise, so m is equal to, let's say, m m is at least uh, this is what I really should have said is at least say one plus uh, epsilon. N. Okay, so it's at least some it's at least some constant bigger than one time. Um, and then Willard followed up in about 1989 uh, with the worst case and, uh, per, per operation. Yeah, actually, I guess I, this is amortized, I guess not, it's amortized log squared n. So it's per, so the total cost is at most n log squared n, the amortized was log squared n. Here it's actually worst case for operation. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll mention, so I won't write this down, but the other version of this problem which appears in the literature is called online labeling. Maybe it also appears in my abstract or the title. Uh, so online labeling, you get the you get a bunch of numbers again, and you're going to label them by numbers from this range one through m. So you're not storing them in an array, but you're just assigning things a label, and you want the labels that you assign to be to preserve order. Um, and but the, yeah, right so the point is you're kind of the numbers that you're getting are in the range one through r so you're trying to compress the label to some s smaller set okay um, I'll also make the comment okay so this case this situation we call the this is the small space regime it's where the space is just linear in the Number of items. Uh, yeah. Could you, could, do you say one uh, each time the item is stored or moved, but not each time the array persists in the grid? That's right. Yeah. Just paying one. Yes. So the upper bound probably don't. I think the up the upper bound. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, we'll I'll I'll show you the upper bound, and uh, I haven't thought about that. I mean, you have to make, yeah, I think it's it probably, well, we'll see what, what it actually, you can think about what it actually costs. Um, yeah, I'll also mention that uh, there's sort of a folklore result. Folklore, which is that you can adapt these algorithms. to the case uh, m equals one. So here, if I give you more space, um, then the, uh, worst case, order login for operation. Okay. 
And then there was a paper of Zhang around 1993, which says that in the case m equals n, so there you have exactly as much space as you have items to store, then you get an order log n cubed. I'm not sure if it's amortized or worst case. I think it's. Uh, I, I, let me not since I don't um, since I don't remember what it is. It's let's just say per operation. Could kill you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure. What? The fact that you can do it in log cubed. Yeah. Although, so it's not so surprising. So what do you do? I mean, I'll just I'll sketch this. Use this as a black box. Okay, the order log squared n. So no, you take the surprise. what? Surprise. Yeah. So you take the first n over two element items, and I give them to you. So those you store in log squared n. Now I give you the next n over four items. So I kind of have n over two spaces left, and I'm storing n over four items. So I think well, if I didn't have these other items in there, if that's all that I had, it would be you know, similarly like log squared n, but it would be log squared of log squared n per item, which only gets multiplied by n over two now. But the problem is you've got some crowding. So now what happens is every time you move, you know, when the effect of having a partially loaded array, so let's say, um, Let's say, let's say it's, at some point I have, you know, n over, I have n over 2 to the j space left. And now I insert the next n over 2 to the j plus 1 items. And what happens is you effectively each item moved, the movement of that item causes about 2 to the j items to move from the stuff that you've already Done. So th think, of the, think of it in this ideal, yeah, I'm not saying this very well. Think of it in the following ideal case, which is that the data is in blocks of 2 to the j, and you have one empty location in each block. Okay, so that's these n over 2 to the j items. Okay, and so now when you, you're kind of implementing the algorithm for loading in half the items, but each time you do a move, that move gets multiplied by 2 to the j. So what you get is for each so you have to move the whole block. block. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to move the whole block. OK. So, I'm, so, what, so, each, so what's going to happen is you know, inserting n items will cause you log squared n, and then inserting n over 2 items, sorry, inser, inserting n items will cost you log squared n per item. Inserting the next n over four items will cost you twice log squared n, and the next n over eight items will cost you four log squared n. And so, so each phase will cost you n log squared n, and you've got log n phases. Yeah. That's right, so it's not amortized. Okay. Um, and so now the so the theorems that I'll talk about today is that um, you know when m equals uh, Cn for c greater than one, uh, and r equal 
C prime M. I'm not, I, I should say, this. I'm not writing the quantifiers carefully on these constants, but I'll say them aloud. So the case that we're going to have is that if M is some constant factor of N, and that can be any constant factor, and R, which is the range of the numbers, is some constant multiple of M, and this C prime will depend on this C, okay. uh, then uh, there is an omega log squared N amortized lower bound, and uh, When m equals n, uh, then for r equal c double prime m, So in other words, the results uh, mentioned up there are tight. Okay. By the way, so what is uh, Avi? How much time do I have? Till twelve twenty. Till twelve twenty. Okay. Fine. Uh, Um, so let me let me say something about the algorithm. So here's a sketch of the upper bound. Okay, so let's assume um, So let's just look at the case that um, m is a power of 2 and n is the one less than a power of 2 and we're putting items in. Okay, so let's view the, uh, so uh, build a binary tree with array locations. As leaves. Now, by a configuration, I mean just a, you've you've gotten some items and they're currently stored. Okay, and now you can look at this binary tree, and I'll assign to each um, node in the binary tree its its density. Okay, and the density that reminds me probably I should turn my phone off. Uh, So the density is just what you think it is. So you have the, a particular node in the binary tree corresponds to a consecutive set of array locations. You look at the fraction of filled locations. Okay, so each uh, node in the tree at level J corresponds to uh, a segment of m over 2 to the j. Yeah, it's a complete binary tree of depth k. Okay. okay. And each node in the tree at level j corresponds to a segment of m over 2 to the j array locations. And uh, 
for a given configuration, which is a storage of some items. Um, for each tree node V, we define rho of V equals the uh, fraction. Well, it is created, but the algorithm is going to use this. Use it. We'll use this array. That's true. So So it's a bookkeeping device for the algorithm. Yeah, it is a bookkeeping device for the algorithm. Okay, and rho of e equals the fraction of. Um, Occupied locations below node V, okay. which means that's the segment of the set of leaves. Okay. Okay, and now the um, so what we're going to do is we're going to set a bunch of thresholds for this density at, at for each level. Okay, and then the algorithm works as follows. When a new item comes in, so let's say just for simplicity, I'm going to temporarily store that item. Just I'm going to find the closest item that's already stored to it, and I store it right on top in the same location, which of course I'm not allowed to do, but I just think of temporarily doing that. And then I recompute the densities going up the tree. And the only nodes whose densities change are the path a lot from that, from the leaf to the root, okay? And now I see, did any, I, now I know that, let's see, the, the threshold, I'm gonna set these density thresholds, which is the maximum density I'm going to allow at a particular node, and the density threshold for a leaf will be one. We allow it to be filled, but now I've exceeded the, the threshold at this particular leaf because it's now density two. Okay, and now I go up the tree and I find the highest, the node closest to the root whose density has been violated. Okay, so the density of that node is too high, but the density of its parent is not too high. Okay, and then what I do is I'm just going to take, um, go up to the parent and take all the nodes stored below the parent and just evenly distribute them across the entire interval. So you just kind of rebalance that node. All right, so. Okay, so when a new item uh, arrives, temporarily store the item um, in the same location as the uh, closest or the currently stored item the uh, tree node closest to the root whose density bound is exceeded. It's really like a quota on the density. And then, uh, so let's call that V and then rebalance 
the items below. So I have to tell you what these thresholds are. Um, say, yeah, they're between. Well, the threshold will be at least one. One is a dense. So, sorry. So at the bottom it's one, and at the top it's a half. Okay. So at the top, at the root, the density is never exceeded because there are only, you know, n items. Okay. So we're prom and now. What we'll do is we'll just, the densities will just be sort of a linear interpolation between those two points. So it will be one half plus the depth, uh, let's see, one half plus if your depth j, j over log n, or, you know, j over k, maybe with a two in the denominator or something like that. So here, I'm just for simplicity, I'm looking at the case n is equal to uh, one half n. Okay, and you can redo it with these other parameters. You just do the same idea. Okay. Okay. So then you just have to argue. So now there's the algorithm. The algorithm is simple. Now you want to analyze the algorithm. Well, you know, no. So what happens, uh, so here, this is why it's a sketch and not a proof. So you have to take care of those details kind of carefully. And you run, you actually run into a little trouble with the way I'm saying it if um, near the bottom, where, you know, where the rounding actually can get you into trouble. But roughly okay. when it's three quarters, you put three elements in every four locations. Uh, yeah. More or less arbitrary. That's right. That's right. This is deterministic, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see. So analysis. Or work, the number of things that were inserted. That's right. That's the proof. And I mean, you just said it. I don't know if, if people followed what you just said. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, now, you have to do the now you have to do the calculation. So how much, first thing is, you know, the cost of rebalancing a node at level J. Well, a node at level J has, corresponds to an interval of size M over 2 to the J. So. I mean, the worst case is that, you know, that's almost filled and then you have to move everything. So the cost of rebalancing a node at level J is less than or equal to M over 2 to the J. Okay. And what we want to show is that, and now the claim is the number of uh, rebalances at level J is less than or equal to 2 to the j times log n. Okay. So if you show this, each one costs m over 2 to the j. The number of rebalances you do is this. So you get m log n 
cost for the rebalance is at level J, and then you add up over the levels, and you get n log squared n. Okay, and now this is what Russell just said. Okay, so the point is, look at look at a particular node at level J. So you rebalance it, and now what has to happen before you have to rebalance it again? Now the point is, when I rebalance this node. So let's say I had this node and I just rebalanced it. So why did I rebalance it? I rebalanced it because one of its children exceeded the threshold. But this guy itself did not exceed the threshold. Now his threshold is lower by 1 over log n than the threshold down here. So when you rebalance, now both of these nodes, the density inside is 1 over log n below the threshold of that node. Okay? So how many items have to be put into here before it exceeds its threshold? Well, there, you know, it's essentially uh, the size of this array divided by uh, log n. Okay? So you have to insert you know, this number of items divided by log n, roughly. And they have to be inserted below this guy in order for that to happen. So now you just say, there, therefore, um, the, this is kind of the cost to the adversary. The adversary, um, in order to cause, you, to cause this rebalance, has to insert this divided by log n. So he's only inserting a total of m items, so he can only cause this number of rebalance. Okay, so that's uh, that's the argument. Any questions? The worst case sequence is actually Say it again. What's the worst case sequence? The worst case sequence for this algorithm? Yeah, you just you want to get the best one. Right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and that and then I'll say so. There was a paper. Um, in the mid 90s by um, Sepphoris and Zhang, which actually, I'm not sure it actually appeared. It would, maybe I think there was a conference paper, but it, uh, in which they, um, they proved the lower bound, a matching lower bound of log squared n, but under a restriction on the algorithm. And the restriction on the algorithm was um, Actually, the restriction is not quite carefully stated. So we went at, there's one, there are two parts to the restriction. The one is that, let's say, if you insert an item, if you insert a new item into, a, into an open, you know, you get a new item and you insert it and you don't move anything around, then you should insert it in the middle, okay, of wherever. You know. So wherever you're going to put it, you put it in the middle of the interval. And then the other restriction is that when you rebalance an interval, you should rebalance it evenly. Okay, so. Let's assume that uh, we thought of this. Let's just give it a minute. Well, no, okay, so no. L let's say you take the set of uh, items that you're going to move. Okay, yeah, so let me, without love to generality, let's say, you know, you know, some, I we have a current configuration your items here. Now the adversary essentially, you know, he gets to choose, okay, where the next item goes because he put he gives you a number that's between this one and this one. Okay, so he okay, so now you decide, let's say, maybe to move some items around. You might not have to. I mean you could so you can assume, actually, that the thing is the algorithm is sort of greedy in the sense that it only moves things when it absolutely is forced to. Um, but let's not, let's not assume that. So you, you make a decision to move some things. So let's say you decide to move you know, 
this guy and these three guys, and you decide to move this guy and this guy. Okay. Now, one thing you can do is you can assume that the set of guys that you end up moving is sort of a contiguous set of guys that are already stored. Because there's no point in moving these. If I insert in here, there's no point in moving these guys at this time. I can always postpone that. Okay. So therefore, there is an interval, a segment within the array where you're doing the rebalance. And there, then you rebalance just means you redistribute, you pick. So you can think of that the algorithm is just picking a subsegment here and then just redistributing the items in some way. And the assumption that they're making is that you redistribute them in an even fashion. Okay, now, so they prove a lower bound under those assumptions, and those assumptions don't necessarily sound that bad, that strong. And in fact, in the literature, um, there is reference to their bound as having solved the lower bound problem. But as an example, so the, the adversarial sequence that you just said, which is, if I just gave you, if the adversary just gives you numbers in order, one, two, three, four, five, dot, 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 then that's the adversarial sequence that works against their algorithm. But obviously, if I know that that sequence is coming, I can do much better, right? So, so this is a, uh, you know, at, at least, you know, that kind of there's, De a definite weakness in that kind of algorithm is that it fails against a really dumb adversary. It just shows that they haven't really, that you can't just trivially modify their proof. You have to actually right. Yeah. yeah, although you need, an adversary that's smarter. you need a smarter adversary. But I will say that despite that, I mean, a lot of the ideas in our proof are derived from their proof. I mean, it's, um, our proof is definitely not done from scratch. I mean, it uses some things from theirs. Okay, so uh, let me tell you something about the lower bound proof. So what should the adversary do? I mean. Intuitively, what's, what's the adversary trying to do? The adversary would like to, you know, he gives you items, and now the algorithm is rebalancing. And each time he has to choose what's the next item to put in. So right at the moment, let's ignore the, this parameter r. r was the range of all the numbers. And let's just say that r is really huge. Okay, so what that means is that if there are two items stored, I can always find an element. I can always give you an element, okay? And then it's, it's not much harder at the end. You have to do one little trick in order to get to, to replace the lower bound so that it works if R is just a not too big multiple of, of the array size, okay? So, so the adversary picks two stored items that are, that are sort of with nothing in between and says, okay, the next item I'm storing is in between those, and now you have to put it in. So where should he choose this? Where it's most crowded. Where it's most crowded. Okay. So the what's that? The greedy. The, greedy. the problem is, how do you measure crowding? Okay. So probably you need to measure it on all scales. Because yeah. I mean, if you look at the algorithm. Exactly. So you have this notion of crowding that's happening at different levels of scale, right? And so somehow you want the adversary to find some point where, uh, sorry, some location in the array which is sort of crowded at all levels of scale. Now, it's kind of easy, and this is uh, something that, this is what was done in the uh, Dietz and Seferis paper, um, sorry, Dietz and Zheng paper, uh, in which, so if you, if you say, well, I'll call something crowded, we have the overall density, let's call that delta, is the overall density of the array. And now 
I want to find a location with the property that for every interval containing that location, the density is high. And you can find it a, in a point with that property such that every interval containing that is at least delta over 2. If the overall density is currently delta, then there is a point which for every interval containing that point, the density of that interval is at least delta over 2. But that's not very good. And that's why. You know, that's still what? close to half, so that there's still plenty of room to store things. Exactly. That, I mean, that, that's a problem. So you need something. So you need a much stronger notion of a point which is, or of, a, of an area which is crowded. Yeah. Well, not, be not, to, not every interval will be crowded, but uh, not, to be, not every interval will have to. And not, you know, you may have just totally rebalanced. The algorithm may have just rebalanced everything. Right. So there may not be such a. That, well, no. So you just you have to like create one, right? Well, no. By crowded, I mean. So it turns out what you're going to, what you would like is a location which is as close as possible to this. So as you say, if it's completely rebalanced, then every interval has the same amount of crowding, which is the density is delta. Okay? And then I'll just insert it anywhere. Now, in general, what I would like is, I would like to find a place which, if I look at every subinterval containing it, the density is as high as I possibly can say. Okay? So the minimum density of an interval containing this guy is high. Okay? And what we would like is to get that to be as close to delta as possible. We can't get it to be bigger than delta because the overall density is delta. But I would like to find, if possible, some location where um, every interval containing it is close to delta. Uh, as I uh, yeah. Uh, every interval uh, of all sizes. Of, of all sizes. So ideally, so if you could do that, you know, it, it, depending on how close to delta you can get, then you can use that as a good adversary to build a, a lower bound. Um, as I say, they used something like that you can get delta over 2, and that uh, doesn't give them such a good lower bound. Um, and it, in fact, then they can't do it. They need. Uh, I'm a little bit confused. So say that you take a top down approach, right? So your overall density is delta. So one of your two coordinates has density over this delta. Right. So you go to that part. Yeah. So one of their two Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, so that's a good point. So what you do is you say you take the tree, and you say, okay, the, you, let's divide. Let's use the binary tree picture. So this guy has density delta. So one of the two children has density delta. Let's move to that, and then one of its two children has density delta. But maybe you know, as you do that, you end up over here, and maybe this part of the array has a huge empty space. Okay, so that's not good for the ad that's a bad choice for the adversary. Okay, so so those kinds of considerations lead one to the following uh, sort of nice properties that you would like to have. So what I would like to do, and what the adversary is going to do, it's going to choose a at every step. It's going to try to find this crowded location. And the way it's going to do it is by choosing a nested sequence of intervals. It'll be order log n nested intervals. Each one will have high density. Each of the nested, so the requirements are, I'm going to have this you know, order log n nested intervals. So it will be always the same number d. So the depth will be d, and d will be log n over 5 or something. Each interval in the sequence is at least half the size of the previous one. The density of the interval here is within 1 over log n of the density of the parent interval. So the density may, that's similar to what's happening in the algorithm, right? The thresholds that we have, the densities, yeah, except it's the reverse direction. So the dense, you know, the thresholds that we set in the algorithm 
We're up, what? We're upper bounds, and also as you go higher up, it gets sparser. Now, now what I'm doing is I'm going to say the requirement that I want is that as I shrink the intervals, each nested interval, the density of this one is at least 1 over log n. It's at least the density of its parent minus 1 over log n. Okay, so as I go down. And then there's one other property that we need, and this is to get away from from this thing, and that is, so let's say, you know, so I'm going to have this sequence of inter nested sequence of intervals, S1, S2, except, so I use the word interval to refer to intervals of time, and I'm going to use the word segment to, to refer to intervals in the array. So these are segments S1, S2, S3. And so I said this one is at least at most half the size of this one. And the density of this is at least the density of this minus 1 over log n. And then the other requirement is this. Um, well. I'm going to say the requirement roughly, and then I'm going to have to uh, refine it a little bit. If I look at the portion to the left of this guy and the portion to the right of this guy, that I look at all the items stored in this array, that at least some constant fraction of the items are in this portion and in this portion. So let's say at least one-tenth of the items from here are in this portion and at least one-tenth of them are in this portion. Okay. So those are the, roughly speaking, and as I say, I'll refine it a little bit, those are the, what I would like to do. So the adversary wants to find this nested sequence of intervals going down with these properties. Okay, now... So, so uh, it's not, you said that the number of segments will be fixed D. Yeah, D will be what, like, yeah, log n over. Yeah, but now you said that you just, uh, you have a bound that's right. Ah. That's right. But that's so right. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, just an upper bound, but to make sure it ends in this. We'll make sure that. It ends, the sequence ends in D steps. I mean, yeah, it'll end in D steps, and maybe what you end up with is a large segment. Oh, okay. Once you end up with this large segment, then it turns out you can, you, the adversary can just put, put something anywhere in that segment. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe you could do that. But, so there's something else, but there's some other thing that I'm going to need here in order to, to make the whole argument work. So this, I mean, I'm describing roughly an adversary, but eventually you have to do the analysis. So you have to set this thing up. So, so here's another property that I want. So um, at each time step, each time step, by time steps I now mean a step at, at, a, at one time step, we, the adversary chooses a new item, and then the algorithm accommodates that item, does some rebalance. Now, the algorithm we said, you know, if I insert an item, you know, it, in this interval, I'm the adversary, and I tell you, you have to insert this, and now you do some rebalance, and we said that rebalance will be some contiguous segment here, and then you doesn't have to evenly rebalance, but he rebalances it in some way. Okay, so I'll call this the busy region at, at, at step t. Okay, so it's a segment in the array such that 
every item in this array has been is moved. That's one one property. Every item in the array is moved, um, and this array this thing includes, you know, the the place where you would have had to look put this one if you didn't move anything. Okay. Um, okay. So I chose at t at step t. The adversary chose this S1 T, S2 T down to S D T. And then he inserts an item here. Now the algorithm responds by choosing an interval B T, which has to you know, include this location, so it overlaps this thing, and it extends out here. Okay, now that BT, which the, ad, which the algorithm chooses, well, you, um, yeah, sorry. So what I want to describe now is at the next step when the adversary chooses this sequence of intervals, he can't just start from scratch. He's not going to start from scratch. Exactly. So he looks at the, the lowest down interval that contains BT okay, of, the, of these intervals. Maybe none of them do. So maybe this in, in, S1T is not the whole thing. It's some interval. So he's going to look at, you know, the, try to go, go down as far as possible to the one that contains BT. And let's say it's S2T. So S2T contains BT, but S3T doesn't. And then what he's going to do is, He's just going to keep these two exactly the same because their densities didn't change. And he's going to, okay. And then he's going to redo the ones below. Well, the ones down below could have changed, their densities could have changed significantly. Oh, you're right. The density of every one of these increases by one. You're right. Okay. Um, but yeah, each one of these is, 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 is it's, it's even better for the adversary. It's even more crowded. Now, when I choose, when the adversary chooses S3 T plus 1, where this is now something which, where BT is not contained in here, then the new S3 T plus 1 must be contained in the union of S3 T and BT. So he's going to re-choose this, this, the, the interval here in such a way. So what you're saying, in other words, you, you, you add you union BT to all of them, and you start from this one. Good. That's a better way of saying it. Yeah. So you take the union of each of these with BT. Some of these are unchanged, and then you start, and then every one will be, a, that you start from that, and you require that the next step that you take is in that union. And there's a little bit of a lie there, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to live with that lie. Okay. Um, okay. Now, um, Okay, so now I'm going to slightly modify the, th the thing I said before. Remember I said that this, this requirement, that when I choose, let's say, S3T below S2T, I need these buffers, right? Where this buffer is, I'm saying that the stuff that's in S2T that's to the left, there should be a significant number of items here and here, okay? Now, I relax that requirement in the following way. So, you know, you take this, take S1T union BT. That's just S1T, S2T union. So this is S3T union B it is the first interval that doesn't contain BT. So, okay, that one I'm going to, I might change. And then, so I call this the critical interval. And for the critical one, 
when I reconstruct that, I don't need this buffer property. Okay, but then everyone below it, when I recreate it, I do need the buffer property. Okay. okay. All right. So, so there are two things I need to t to show you. And I've got about nine minutes to do it. So I'll, let me just I'll sketch it. Um, the two things that I need to show you is that we can actually carry this out. So and that is to say, at every step, we can choose these S's in such a way that the densities go down by this amount. And uh, you have these buffers. Okay. So let me, let me sketch. Let me just give a quick sketch of how you do that. Um, or at least a sketch of how, you know, why you might think that you should be able to do it. What's that again? OK, so I take this thing, and the first thing I do is I, I look at, I say, are there any intervals? Sorry, sorry. So this is, uh, yeah, so S1t, let's say S, well, at each step time, let's say I have to tell you how we start this thing. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm sorry. We start, of course, with the empty array. So I forgot to say another, another component of, this, of the argument is that we're loading in n, r, we load in n items. And the way we're going to do the analysis is, since I'm going, to give you, I'm going to make things easy on you in the following sense, I'll give the algorithm n over two items. And I'll say, you can store those anywhere you want to start the algorithm, and it's free. Okay. So now the, the, the array is partly loaded. Now you've decided how to store them, and now I have to choose S1t. So I choose S1t to be the, I look over all the intervals of size n over 2, and I take the densest one. Okay, and that will be my, my S1. Okay, and it's easy to show that, in fact, that there's a, you can do that more or less. Uh, yeah, in fact, I, maybe I, I'll, I don't require that it be exactly n over 2. It's between n over 4 and n over 2, and I find the densest one, and that's the. And there will be such an interval whose density is at least the density of the whole array, just by breaking break the array up into equal size, or mostly equal size chunks, and just take the densest one. OK, so that will be S1t. Now you want to choose S2t with these various properties. So. Um, So what I want to do is. No, he wants to leave uh, ten percent. Yeah. So that's the the problem is that it could be that you know, that, and this is the difficulty is that the density may be sort of um, higher at the ends. So if you take some interval in the middle, its density is low, and so if you take the highest density thing, it's sort of pushed over to the end, and then you don't have this buffer at either end. OK, so. Um, Yeah, something's bothering me here. Uh, I 
I may have oversimplified things. In preparing the talk, I simplified some technical argument in a way which I thought would be clearer, but I may have simplified it in a way that made it false. Um, No, so the I mean the thing that that Swastik just said is bothering me, and I didn't, which is that if I said if I said that there's no so what happens if the one tenth of the items you know the first one tenth are all crammed in over here, and the last one tenth are crammed in over here. Well, this could be good for you. What? Yeah, so that's not so good. So if I throw these away, then the density of what's left is uh, too high. I mean, it's too low. low. It's too low. So then maybe you could have built an H1B to reject that density. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. OK, right. sorry, right. sorry. The algorithm can go up. Yeah, sorry. Size of the interval yeah, like okay, the, sorry. The minimal number of elements it contains. Yeah, sorry. So the, so okay, I, I I lied about this about how to pick the first interval. Um and you want the smallest interval that contains at least four elements in the interval. Okay. Or it begins right at the origin. So what happens is so what what we have is sort of a kind of a careful potential function for choosing the interval, which sort of balances the density with the size. Okay, so what's going to happen is you're willing to shrink the interval. This is why these intervals might shrink by more than a factor of two. And what you're going to do is try to find an interval. Um, Uh, okay. Let me just let me take a quick look at my notes because I'm. Uh, So in choosing the S's, we actually have to introduce these auxiliary things, which are T's. OK, so I'm going to choose T1, T, and then S1, T, and then T1, T, T2, T, and then S2, T. And they are done in the following sequence. So t it's T1, T, which is this thing of size n over 2. Okay. And then S1, T is um, something which is obtained, uh, can be thought of as being obtained in the following way. You look for um, define this potential of an interval s to be the size of the interval times the density 
to this power one over kappa. Kappa is going to turn out to be, I guess, eventually uh, Let's, let me do it here. Okay, so this thing is saying that the potential is the size of the interval multiplied by its density raised to a power. Okay. And uh, what we're going to do is we, we start with T and then we look over all subsegments. Among all subsegments, we take the one which maximizes this. Okay. And what you can show is that it can't, because of th this th because of this term, it can't shrink too much. Because if it shrinks too much, then this will get too. This will it won't be the maximum. Okay. So if you take this thing. Let me just say what you do. So you start from this interval. You take the subinterval of this, which maximizes the potential. That's S1t. Then you take the middle third of S1t, and that's T2t. Then you, again, maximize the potential, and that will be S2t. Okay. Since you're taking the middle third each time, these two intervals will provide the buffer. And one of the properties that in the sense of space. So this is just the middle third in the sense of space. The claim is that this has to have a substantial fraction of these. Because if it didn't, then I would have taken a smaller interval. To, then I would have shrunk the interval when I minimized the potential. OK. So that gives you those properties. And I think I better stop here. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, so what? Why, why, uh, but maybe it's a question to go again. But what is the uh, reason that if you do that, then uh, you know, How do you get a lower get bound? A lower bound yeah. yeah. So why don't we do this? Why don't we yeah. end the talk? And then I, will, I can talk for another 15 min 10 or 15 minutes and you know, after the talk is over. And, uh, well, no, I want to give people an option to leave. Well, I'll turn my back, you know, and then. It, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, so let's thank Mike. And <laughs>